بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة يا غريب يا مظلوم كربلا تبتم وتعبت الأرض التي فيها دفنتم سيدي فيا ليتنا يا ليتنا يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز والله فوزا عظيما صلى الله على محمد وعلى محمد <تصفيق> أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي بيده الملك وهو على كل شيء قدير الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق ونور أرش أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين سيدنا الممجد بشيرنا المصدق المصف الأمجد محمود الأحمد حبيب الله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد وم صلى الله محمد وعلى محمد وعلى محمد ولا هي بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المذلومين ما بعد قال الله تعالى في محكم كتاب الحكيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أفمن يمشي مكبا على وجهه أهداء أمن يمشي سويا أمن يمشي سويا على صراط مستقيم قل هو الذي أنشأكم وجعل لكم السمع والأبصار والأفئدة قليلا ما تشكرون صدق الله العلي العظيم صلى الله على محمد وعلى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى محمد وعلى محمد My respected and beloved elders, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I begin in the name of Allah Azza wa Jal, the most beneficent, the most merciful, Malik al-Muluk, the master of all masters, Shahin Shah, the king of kings. Within the 67th chapter of the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the third and fourth verses states, الذي خلق سبع سماوات طباقا ما ترى في خلق الرحمن من تفاوت فرجع البصر هل ترى من فطور Well Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that it's he who's created the seven heavens and he stacked them one on top of the other and he says what? He says that look at it and look at the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and see if you can spot an, a, a mistake see if you can spot an error then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the very next verse ثم مرجع البصر كرتين you know, look, look away. ثم مرجع البصر كرتين ينقلب إليك البصر خاسئ وهو حسير. That again, if you turn away and you look again, and you look at this creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you'll see, you'll be dazed, you'll be confused. Look at the utmost perfection in the creation, in the khalq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَمْ خُلِقُوا مِنْ غَيْرِ شَيْءٍ أَمْ هُمُ الْخَالِقُونَ Was it us or were you created from nothing? Or were you yourself the creator? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that the perfection in my system can't be matched. That if you look at an astrophysicist like Neil deGrasse Tyson, he has a very interesting video where he talks about if the earth were to stop rotating, were to stop spinning for one second. And he talks and he says that if the earth were to stop rotating for one second, it would be catastrophic. You'd have people flying out of buildings. That anyone not bolted down to the ground would go flying because the earth is spinning at 800 miles per hour. It's like when you're going in a car and all of a sudden you you know, you get into an accident. If you're not wearing a seatbelt, if you're not bolted down, you're going to go flying through the window. Why? Because you're going at a certain speed and all of a sudden you stop. So you go, if you're not wearing a seatbelt, you're going flying through the window. In the same way, if the earth is spinning eastward, you see that we were and it's going 800 miles per hour. If it were to stop for one single second, one single second it would stop, most of humanity would die. Can you imagine the, the perfection within the system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And even when you look at the brain and you look at our, our mind, both Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did it, you know, when the creation of the universe and within, you know, the human as well. That you see that there's two types of brains or there's, there's a brain with two parts in it. You have the neocortex, which is more of an analytical part. And then you have the inside, you have the limbic brain, which is the inner part of the brain. There's a man by the name of Simon Sinek. This individual has an excellent TED talk where he talks about why we do what we do. And in this why, he makes it according to the brain. So he has three circles. All of the three circles are within each other. On the outermost circle, you have what? On the middle circle, you have how. 
and you have on the innermost circle, you have Y. And he goes on to say and explain how even the brain works in the same way. That when we have a gut feeling, you know, when we say we, you know, we feel like we need to do this, it's because of the why. And he talks about how successful leaders, people who have had success throughout history, it's always because they go to the why, to the purpose, to the origination, to the goal, instead of going to the how and the what. That when you see a company like Apple, their marketing strategy is based off of what? Apple today has more money than the U.S. government. You see that Apple today in their strategy of marketing, they say that we want to appeal to the why. And he goes on to say there were certain leaders throughout history that because they understood this why and because their why, the reason for why they were doing what they were doing resonated so well, it was contagious. He talks about even, for example, the Wright brothers. The Wright brothers, nobody on their entire staff had a college education, including Orville or Wilbur Wright. The Wright brothers are the first ones to, to have man flight. There was another man by the name of Samuel Pierpont Langley. And this is the point that I want to make. That no matter how much innovation you have, no matter how much money you can give to a person, if you don't have a purpose, if you don't have a true why of why you're doing what you're doing, you're going to be stuck. There was a man who was funded by the U.S. government named Samuel Pierpont Langley. And he was followed around. People were saying, how is he possibly going to have man flight? You know, he has an excellent crew of workers. But you see, because he doesn't have the why... When Orville and Wilbur Wright finally take man flight, you see he stops working. Because now, because I don't have the fame, I don't have the glory, now because it's all on them, now why does it matter if I do, you know, if I make this man flight? Hence he was unsuccessful. But because Orville and Wilbur Wright, because they wanted this goal, they had this purpose, I want to make and I want to have humans go to man flight, I will have, you know, I have a clear goal. And you look at even, he continues and talks about a person like Martin Luther King. And subhanAllah, everything, I swear to you, brothers and sisters, everything goes back to Ahlul Bayt. Look how revered Martin Luther King is in the society. That people like President Obama and many individuals throughout history have said what? That we look to Martin Luther King for our, our motivation, our inspiration. Martin Luther King says, my inspiration was Gandhi. And it wasn't it Gandhi who said that I learned from Hussein how to achieve victory while being oppressed? Can you imagine? Everything, brothers and sisters, goes back to Muhammad and Al-Muhammad. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So he talks about how Martin Luther King in this, you know, age of non-social media. Today, if we want to, you know, broadcast an event, if we want a lot of people to see a specific event, we can, you know, we can make it known very quickly. That if an event takes place, you know, if a big celebrity, you know, for example, something were to happen to them, for example, within 24 hours, even less, we would know exactly what happens. In this age, or back then in the time of Martin Luther King, because the purpose within him and the why resonated within him so well, that 250,000 people showed up when he gave the I have a dream speech. And even when you look at the speech that he gave, it wasn't, it wasn't a, uh, you know, I have a plan speech. It was the I have a dream speech. That I want people to know my purpose for me being here. That when 250,000 people showed up, they were sick and tired and they were here for themselves. They wanted to feed off of his purpose they wanted to feed off of his why and at the end of the day they wanted to do that same good within themselves that when you have that certainty within your purpose that you can go and you can eradicate the issues of the world and you see this even in the story of the of prophet musa alayhi salam in the story of prophet musa you see that prophet musa is told by the magicians He's told by the missions, by the magicians, O Matilka Biaminika, Ya Musa, O Musa, what is in your right hand? Where he says, What? I have this stick, and on the stick I lean on it, for example, I use it to uh for my shepherd. And you see, I see it to, you know, use my uh to do work. So you see what they say, okay, Musa, we want you to throw your stick. Because the magicians, you know, they had thrown their sticks. And they, you know, when they threw their sticks, it had a certain chemical within it where it turned, it looked under the sun as if it was a snake. So when Musa throws his snake, the magicians, when he throws his stick and it actually turns into a snake and it eats up all of their snakes, they're thinking to themselves, now we're in trouble. Because a magician knows his craft. Meaning that when we're throwing this stick, we can make it appear like it's a stick on this sand, on this ground. But when Musa throws it, this is an actual snake when it comes and eats it. But you see, there's something beautiful within the story of the magicians. Because when the magicians say, Amanna birabbi Harun, uh, they say, we, we submit to the Lord of Harun and Musa. Amanna birabbi Harun wa Musa. We submit to the Lord of Harun and Musa. That Fir'aun threatens them with death. 
when we give charity, and I want to make this point, when we make charity, when we give charity, excuse me, we have a personal reward from it. Even though we say, you know, Ya Allah, I'm giving this charity, or I'm giving this charity to humanity, because I'm giving this charity now, I'm going to feel good about it. I'm going to feel, even if I'm a person who has a lot of wealth, if I give charity, I'm going to feel good about it. But see, in that transaction of giving, you have a reward, you have an intrinsic reward. What's amazing about the story of, of the magicians in the time of Prophet Musa is that Fir'aun threatens them with death. But they say, what? We believe in the Lord of Harun and we believe in the Lord of Musa. Fir'aun, you can throw whatever you want at us. You can throw us off a cliff. You can torture us. But our certainty in the Lord of Musa and the Lord of Harun will remain. See how they're going to die? When you die, there's no intrinsic reward. That certainty is beautiful, brothers and sisters, that, that when those magicians see that the stick of Musa eats their snakes, they accept the Lord of Harun and Musa. Why? Because they have that certainty within their Lord. They have the certainty within their creation. When you look at even our Imams, when you look at how they would give, you know, without wanting any reward, when they would have that certainty that when they come, when the poor, when the wafer, when they come, they say what? When the poor person comes to them, they give. And why do they give? We do not do it for anyone. We don't do it for anything but the shukr of our Lord. How beautiful is that? That when Ahlul Bayt, when they give, they don't do it because they want a thank you. They want, you know, you know, we appreciate you giving this to us in our time of need. No, if there's someone who's surfing in humanity, we will help them. If there's someone who's oppressed, we will help them. If there's somebody who's being cheated, if there's somebody who's being wronged, we will help them. We don't do it for thank you. We do it because we're expecting a day. And we know there's a day when we're going to be made answerable to our Lord. And even beyond that, that famous saying of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wa salam, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa al-Muhammad wa al he says, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, I don't worship you for fear of hell because that's the worship of a slave. Ya Allah, I don't worship you for the, for, in order to attain heaven because that's the worship of a businessman. Ya Allah, I worship you because you're worthy of being worshipped. How Imam Amir al says, Ilahi kafani bi'izzan an akuna laka abda wa kafani fakhran an takuna li rabba Ilahi kama uhib faj'alni kama tuhib Imam Amir al comes and he says the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful lines I've ever heard. He says, Ya Allah, it's enough for me that I'm your servant. And it's enough of an honor for me that you are my Lord. Ya Allah, you are as I like. Ya Allah, make me as you like. Ya Allah, you are as I like. Ya Allah, make me as you like. And you see this replete within our history, brothers and sisters, within the history of Ahlul Bayt. You see that this, there's one example after another. If you take even our blessed Imam Ali ibn al-Husayn, Zayn al-Abideen alayhi salatu wa salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. When you take Imam Ali ibn Hussein, you see that there was a certain man named Hisham bin Ismail al-Maghzuni, who was a very tyrannical governor in the time of, in the time of Imam Zayn al-Abideen. When the fifth Umayyad Khalifa, or when the fourth Umayyad Khalifa, uh, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, when he dies, he had around 21 years of torturing the followers of Muhammad and al-Muhammad. That the people were sick and tired of this individual. He was the fourth of Bani Umayyah, fourth Khalifa. He dies. Then his son, Walid ibn Abdul Malik, becomes the Khalifa of the entire, uh, of the, he becomes the Khalifa, the fifth Khalifa. When he becomes the Khalifa, he knows that if he wants to have, you know, peace, if he wants to make sure that the people don't overturn him, what he has to do is he has to make sure he has to remove this Hisham bin Ismail. Hisham bin Ismail had been so terrible, even to another of the Holy Prophet, a compiler of narration. You see, there was a man by the name of Sa'id bin Musayyib. This man, because Sa'id bin Musayyib didn't want to give his uh, allegiance to Hisham bin Ismail, Hisham bin Ismail ordered that he be whipped 60 times and that he be taken in a cloth, wrapped around and thrown out of the city. This same Hisham bin Ismail, Walid bin Malik is thinking that if I keep this individual within my government, that the people will rebel against me because there's just been a change in Khilafat. I must change and put somebody else in power. So he puts Umar bin Abdul Aziz. When Umar bin Abdul Aziz is put in power, 
You see that he takes this Hisham bin Ismail, who had been treacherous to Ahlul Bayt, who had been treacherous to Imam Zain al-Abideen. You see that he takes this Hisham bin Ismail and he puts him in front of the house of Marwan ibn al-Hakam and he ties him up and he says, whoever wants to take revenge on this, then take it. The companions of Imam Zain al-Abideen come to him and when they come to him, they say, Ya Imam, now is our time to take revenge. Imam Zain al-Abideen says, we the Ahlul Bayt, we don't hurt somebody when they're down. That when a person is treacherous towards us, when a person is rude towards us, we respond with nothing but kindness. That Imam Zain al-Abideen, because everyone was waiting, Hisham bin Ismail, we will take revenge on him. Everyone is waiting for the Imam to take revenge. Imam Zain al-Abideen comes, and when he comes, he says, Salamun alaykum ya Hisham. He says it in a very loud voice that every single person around can hear. He says, Assalamu alaikum ya Hisham. He says, if there is a debt that you need repaid, I will repay it. If there's water that you need, if you're hungry, I will give you water. If you want food, I will give you food. Look at the generosity of Muhammad and al-Muhammad. And even if we look at another narration of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, Salawatullah alayhi wa sallam wa alayhi. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ala farajum. You see generosity at the highest. Imam Ali alayhi salam, in his Khilafat, he had three civil wars in a very short period of time. So people are very, very upset. But Imam Amir al muminin says what? If there's zulm, even though these people are starting battles with me, if there's zulm and I have to fight last case scenario, I will, no problem. But you see, people were very upset. You know, people didn't like this. So what happens is, is that Imam Amir al muminin one time is going home. When he's going home, he sees a, a lady and she's having a very difficult time. You know, uh, she doesn't have food, she doesn't have anything. So he goes to the lady, he says, you know, what's, what's wrong? Why are you like this? She says, you know, I'm very upset because this Khalifa, Ali, he's taken, you know, my father and my brother and my sons, they've all died in his battles. And he remains alive. So she starts cursing Imam Ali. And he says, you know, what is it that you need? She says, you know, I'm just warming this water. I want to make it seem to my children as if there's something to eat. So Imam Ali والسلام, said, I will be the one who gives you bread. I will be the one who cooks for you. I will, do, I will go through all of this. Imam Amir al muminin does this day after day after day. Until one time that the daughter walks in. When she walks into the house and she's, she sees Ali ibn Abi Talib, the Khalifa of their town leaving, the Khalifa of Kufa. You see that when he's leaving, she says, oh mother, did you see who just walked out? She says, it's a good man. I don't know who he is. I haven't even asked him his name. She says, this is our Khalifa Ali ibn Abi Talib. This lady goes running after and she says, I am honored that my sons, my father, my brothers, they sacrifice for you. How amazing, brothers and sisters, the generosity of Muhammad and al-Muhammad. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa But very little we're grateful, brothers and sisters. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the story of Sulaiman is an excellent example for us. When you look at the story of Sulaiman, Sulaiman had so much wealth, it can never be matched. That even when the Queen of Sheba, when she was walking, you know, into the kingdom of Sulaiman, it seemed, you know, as if she was walking on water. Because to, when, it, when, it, when she was walking on the glass, it seemed like she was walking on water. But it was so fine, there was such a fine architecture to it that she thought she was walking on water. She noticed later on that it's glass. You think, of, imagine of this kingdom of Sulaiman alayhi salam. That Sulaiman, when he sees that ants are walking in front of him, Sulaiman had the opportunity to even communicate with animals. Sulaiman, he's the inheritor of Dawood alayhi salam. When Sulaiman sees the ant walking in front of him, he makes an amazing dua. And he says, ya, he says, Rabbi o zi'ni an ashkura ni'mataka allati an'amta alayhi. An'amta alayhi wa ala walidayhi wa, wa an'amla salihan tarba wa adkhilni bi rahmatika fi ibadika salihin. He says, Ya Allah, invoke in me the power and the ability. Invoke in me, give me. Sulaiman, you have an outstanding kingdom like this. You can communicate with the animals. You are the inheritor of Dawood. You're saying, invoke in me gratefulness. You're the one who's saying, Ya Allah, please give me the power to thank you. Give me the power to thank you for what you've given me and my parents. That Ya Allah Rabbi Ozani an ashkura ni'mata kalati an amta ale and you see wa am wa amal salih an tarba wa dhilni bi rahmatika fi ibadika salihin. That Sulaiman when he's saying he says Ya Allah please allow me to understand your mercy. 
He says, Ya Allah, please allow me to understand this so that I may die amongst the righteous servants. When our imams speak, even in dua, Kumail, we see Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says what? فَلَئِنْ سَيَّرْتَنِي لِلْقُوبَاتِ مَا عَدَائِكْ وَجَمَعَتَ بَيْنِي وَأَبَيْنَ أَحْلِ بَلَائِكْ And you see he continues. And Imam Amir Mu'mineen, our first imam, an infallible person, he's saying, Ya Allah, what if you were to put me with those companions of the fire? What if you were to put me in the fire with those who transgressed against you, with those who were ungrateful? This is an imam talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look how the imam, how Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, how he's turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's saying, Ya Allah, what if you put me like this? If you put me like this, Ya Allah, what is it that I would do? It's amazing, brothers and sisters, how little we're ungrateful. Even when we accept the religion of Islam, when we say, when we do all of these fantastic events, I swear, brothers and sisters, it's nothing. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, there would be Arabians who would come to the Holy Prophet. And when they would come to the Holy Prophet, they would make it seem as if they were doing the Prophet a favor by accepting the religion of Islam. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and it said, يَمُنُّونَ عَلَيْكَ أَنْ أَسْلَمُوا That when they accept Islam, they think it as a favor upon you. يَمُنُّونَ عَلَيْكَ أَنْ أَسْلَمُوا قُلْ لَمْ تُؤْمِنُوا وَلَكِنْ قُولُوا أَسْلَمْنَا وَلَمَّا يَدْخُلِ الْإِيمَانُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ that the Holy Prophet, that they say what? That if you believe that Islam is a favor upon you, no. You do believe that you are a favor upon Islam? No, Islam is a favor upon you. Islam is a favor that we've conferred upon you. We're the ones who have given you the ability to reach your perfection. You don't understand. You don't think. You don't, you don't, you're not grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And even when you look at the story of Prophet Idris alayhi salam, when you look at the story of Prophet Idris alayhi salam, you see people who are very ungrateful, who've lost their path away. And even remembering this, this one story before I get to, to, uh, to the story of Prophet Idris, there was one scholar who came forth and he said, it amazes me in insan, that insan doesn't have the obedience of an animal. So they asked him, you know, why is it that you say insan doesn't have the obedience of an animal? He says, because if insan, or when you look at an animal, if you look at a dog, for example, if you gave him water, if you gave him food, that dog would never go to another person. They say a dog is a man's best friend, isn't it? That if you gave a dog food, if you gave a dog water, this dog would come back to you. And I remember even outside of my house, there would be ducks and we would feed them, you know, bread. And then every day I would say, mommy, your, your friends are here in front of the door. Because the ducks would come back every single time. If you feed an animal, if you give an animal food, if you give an animal water, that animal is going to come back to you. Whereas insan, no matter how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestows upon him, how is it that he turns away from his Lord? That insan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him so much, yet these, yet insan still turns away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you look at the story of Prophet Idris, you see a person who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes in the Qur'an. For example, the verse that I quoted at the very beginning, yamshi mukibban ala wajhihi, ahda yamshi sawiya. You see this person who says what? You see this person who is like the one who grovels on the ground. Can you compare the one who grovels after this dunya? The, to the one who is upright, Sirat al Afamayamshi Mukibn ala Wajhi, Ahda Amayamshi Sawiyan, ala Sirat al Mustaqim. Can you compare the one who runs after this dunya, the one who runs after this wealth? Can you compare him to the one who keeps his face upright? You see in the story of Prophet Idris alayhi salam, in the story of Prophet Idris alayhi salam, you see a king who's very tyrannical. You see a king one day, he's walking by a piece of land. When he's walking by a piece of land, you see that it's a very amazing amazing piece of land. He sees that it's very green, it's very ripe, he sees all of these. So he thinks to himself, you know, I like this, I'm the king, I could probably pay any son of, sum of money for it. So he goes and he inquires, who is it that, you know, owns this piece of greenery? So they say, you know, it's this person right here, this person is the one who owns this uh, piece of greenery. When they go, when he goes to the person, he says, you know, you have a marvelous piece of land. He says, thank you. He says, you know, if I were to, you know, buy it from you, can I go ahead and purchase from you? He says, you know, this is for my family. You know, you're the king. I'm a servant. I, you know, this is the only piece of income for me. As if you take this piece of land away from me, there's no way that I can support and provide for my family, no matter how much money you give me. 
So the king says to him, you know, he's upset now because the king, he's been rejected. The king now, you know, he everything he wants, he should have. The king returns back to his palace. When he goes back to his palace, his wife comes in. His wife, the narrations mentioned that she was from a tribe called the Azariqa, who were very intelligent, and she had blue eyes. When his wife sees him and she sees how angry he is, she says to him, why is it that you're angry? And he recounts to her the story. She says, why are you mad? She says, why is it that you're upset? The king said, you know, because I can't have this piece of land. She said, real power, or the ones who are get angry and the ones who get upset, is when they don't have power in order to take advantage of people or in order to take revenge of people. Look, shaitan, sometimes it comes in the form of a hubris, in, for, in the form of iblis, but it also comes in the form of insan as well. When she says this, he says, so what do you want us to do? She says, I'm going to take some from my tribe, the Azariqa. I will take them and I will tell them to make a rumor about this individual saying that this person is one who has transgressed against Allah's power or has followed another religion. He has apostated. So the king says, I'm okay with this. When the king, you know, when she, when she says that, you know, you're okay with this, he says, I'm okay with this. She goes to her tribe. She says, I want you to do this and this. A group from the Azariqa, they go towards the man, they capture him, and they bring him towards the king. When they bring him towards the king, they say to the king, they say to him, this man is apostated. So the king in front of everyone says, you've heard them, he's gone against the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, against our religion, let's behead him. They kill the man and he usurps the land. After he usurps the land, you see what happens is, is that when he usurps the land, Idris alayhi salam, who's the prophet in his time, is very upset. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to Idris what happens. When Idris finds out what happens, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Idris what happens, he says, I want you to go and tell him. And Idris says to this king, he says to him, how dare you? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I gave you so much, but you let your power, you let your greed take hold of you. Your love of this dunya took over you. Abundance has diverted you. But wait until there's going to be a day when you will come forth in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Prophet Idris alayhi salam, when he goes to this king and he says this statement, he says, the king says, I'm going to kill you as well. Prophet Idris alayhi salam, because he's running away from the king, you see that someone in his government, he walks away. Then the king says, I want to kill this Idris alayhi salam. His wife says what? His wife says to him, no problem, we will kill him too. Idris, someone from his court comes to Prophet Idris. When they come to Prophet Idris alayhi salam, they say, oh Idris, it's going to be someone who's going to come to kill you. So Prophet Idris alayhi salam, he goes and he hides in a cave. And Prophet Idris, when he was speaking to the king, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made a prediction that I will make sure that your kingdom falls and that your wife's body, it will be eaten by dogs. You see that Prophet Idris alayhi salam, when he goes and he hides in the cave, it, uh, the king is sending search party after search party to go and find Idris and to kill him. You see that eventually what happens is, is that they're unable to find Idris. And Idris, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows an angel to bring him food and water every single day, so he never has to leave the cave. Since Idris alayhi salam never has to leave the cave, you see that what happens eventually is, people rebel against the king to where the king's palace, to where the king's power is overturned. It only took Idris to say what? It took Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a few moments to topple this man. Look how Saddam Hussein in Iraq. Saddam Hussein in Iraq for so long, he killed so many, so many scholars of Ahlul Bayt. So many. Yeah, and he would have statues made in front of him. He would have statues made of himself for everybody to see. Look where Saddam Hussein is now. We all go to the same ground, brothers and sisters. We should never forget this. That Madden Albright, and I can only imagine, brothers and sisters, kings like this, oppressors like this, I can only imagine what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will do, that, do to them on the day of judgment. That people say, why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made, you know, hell? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made hell for people like this. That openly, they want to reject Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There was another lady named Madeline Albright. She was a, this Madeline Albright, there were certain sanctions that killed in Iraq. It killed around 500,000 Iraqi children. 500,000 Iraqi children. And when they asked her, is it okay 
you know, that these children are dying. Is it okay that this is happening? She said, you know, it's a decision that we have to make. It's okay. You know, these 500,000 children died. It's okay. No problem. This is the ones. These are the ones who have lost their purpose on this world. They've lost certainty within Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Abu Abdullah al Hussein is reminding even on the day of Karbala. When Abu Abdullah al Hussein is telling and going and saying one sermon after another, Abu Abdullah al Hussein is saying, Come towards my side. Do not lose hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even the doors of forgiveness now are open for you. That Abu Abdullah al Hussein, up until his final moments, is giving da'wah to these people. And even when they're killing him, they're killing his family, he's thinking that these people will be liable on the day of judgment for killing me and my family. And you see this especially in two boys, brothers and sisters. And it's these two boys we honor on a night like this. Owen and Muhammad were two very young children who people had no remorse for on the day of Karbala. Owen and Muhammad, just to give a little bit of background, they're sons of Abdullah, son of Jafar, son of Ja'far al-Tayyar. Ja'far ibn Abu Talib is the son of Abu Talib. He's the brother of Imam Ali alayhi salatu wasalam. He's the brother of Imam Ali and the Holy Prophet, when he sent some Muslims because they were going and undergoing persecution in Mecca, in Medina, you see that the Holy Prophet in Mecca, you see that the Holy Prophet sends Ja'far ibn Abu Talib, he sends him to Abyssinia. And Ja'far ibn Abu Talib with somebody there from Quraysh telling the priest, the owner of the land, when they come, Ja'far ibn Abu Talib is saying, this is what's revealed to us in our Quran. That even though you're a Christian, even though we're Muslims, the principles of our religion are very, very similar. That there was another man from Quraysh who was trying to say, don't let these people stay here peacefully. So Ja'far ibn Abu Talib is the one who convinced this priest, told him, there's a whole chapter in our Quran named after the mother of Isa alayhi salam, Maryam. This Ja'far ibn Abu Talib, he was killed in the battle of Mu'ata. He had his arms cut off. And Jibra'il told the Holy Prophet that this Ja'far ibn Abu Talib is so honored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we call him Ja'far al-Tayyar now because he will have wings in paradise. This Ja'far ibn Abu Talib is the father of Abdullah ibn Ja'far. He is the son, uh, Abdullah ibn Ja'far is the son of Ja'far ibn Abu Talib. Abdullah ibn Ja'far on that day of Karbala or the preceding moments before the Karbala, the preceding days, he tells his sons, I am unable to go in battle because he would love to defend the religion of Islam. He says, I am not able to go in battle today. But he says, my sons, because of my old age, I can't go. But if Hussein ibn Ali, our master, if he's cornered, I want you to go onto the battlefield. That Sayyidah Zainab, on the night before Karbala, Abu Abdullah Hussein was walking around all the tents. And he was walking around all of the tents and he was listening to what everyone was saying. Since he was listening to what everyone was saying, at there's one point where he comes to the tent of Sayyidah Zainab. Sayyidah Zainab is sitting with Owen and Muhammad. When she's sitting on the tent or she's sitting by the tent of Owen and Muhammad, you see what happens is, is that when she's sitting next to the tent, she starts telling them that you are the sons of Ali. You are the sons of Abu Talib. You are the sons of Ja'far al-Tayyar. Please make sure that tomorrow on that day that you don't leave Abu Abdullah al Hussein. That you go out and fight. Understand where your heritage is. That these boys, brothers and sisters, these boys the next day, say the Zainab has to get them ready. Can you imagine a parent getting their kids ready for battle to go and sacrifice themselves? That say the Zainab, she goes and she tries to get her boys, she tries to get Owen and Muhammad ready. And when she gets them ready, the next day, the day of Karbala, you see that those Owen and Muhammad, they want to go towards Abu Abdullah al-Hussein. But when they're trying to go towards Abu Abdullah al-Hussein, they go towards their uncle every time he looks away. When Owen and Muhammad would come, they would want to fight for Abu Abdullah al-Hussein. They want to fight for their Imam. You see what happens is, is that Abu Abdullah al Hussein turns away every single time. Until they go to their mother Zainab, they say, Our mother Zainab, Abu Abdullah al Hussein, our uncle doesn't let us go towards the battlefield. Zainab replies, she, Zainab goes to Abu Abdullah al Hussein. She says, Ya Abu Abdullah, my brother, these two are mine. I want you to let them, let them go towards battle. Abu Abdullah al Hussein says, No, I can't let these 
nephews of mine go towards battle. That when she, when he says this, Sayyidah Zainab replies to him, and she says to him, O oh, Hussein, understand that this is a command of Abdullah ibn Jafar, that he said, since I am not able to represent, ja since I am not able to represent on that day, I want these two little boys to come out and represent me. That Odin Muhammad, finally, Abu Abdullah Hussein, when he goes, he says, O oh, Abbas, I want you to prep these for battle. I want you to prep these little two boys for battle. And they were so inexperienced. They were so small, brothers and sisters, that, Ab that Abbas alayhi salam, he's telling them, when someone comes from this way, I want you to do this. When someone comes from another direction, you do this. When someone comes from Maysara, do this. When someone comes from Maymana, do this. I want you to do this and fight in this way. That Owen and Muhammad, when they're going, that they're ready for battle now. And Abu Abdullah al Hussein and Abbas, because they're such small children, 11 and 9 years old, that Abbas and Hussein ibn Ali have to pick them up to put them on the horse. That Abbas and Hussein have to pick them up to put them on the horse. These Owen and Muhammad, when they go towards the battlefield, they would fight side by side, they would fight together. And since they would fight together, Owen would say, when someone's coming behind you, Muhammad, look, someone's coming behind you. When Muhammad sees someone's coming behind Owen, they would say, oh, Owen, look behind you. Until one point when Muhammad is struck down. Aun on that day had a famous couplet where he says, How dare you attack my uncle Abu Abdullah Hussein? How dare you attack our family? That I will be the one who defends it. The Holy Prophet Ja'far al Tayyar is waiting for me. That Aun he goes and he sees Muhammad, he falls down. He says, Oh Muhammad, be patient. He goes towards Muhammad and he's fighting until all of a sudden Aun is struck down too. That when they're struck down, when Aun falls to the ground, he says, Ya Umma Adrikni. He says, My uncle, help me. Abu Abdullah Hussein, his face had gone pale. When his face had gone pale, pale him and the Abbas, they go towards the Maidan. And you see, even in narration, it's mentioned that Aun and Muhammad, as they were dying, they embraced themselves as they were near. Abu Abdullah Hussein, Abbas, they go and they bring the body back. When they bring the bodies of these two little boys back, it said that whenever a family member would come back, all the women and all of the children would come out and cry on the bodies. They would come out, they would cry. Say the Zainab would always come out and cry. But when Abdullah and when On and when Muhammad, when they come back, you see that when the bodies are brought, Everyone is crying except Sayyidah Zainab. Historians note that Sayyidah Zainab might have come out per chance that her brother Hussein be disturbed. That the next day when the caravan is brought in Kufa, you see what happens is, is that Umar ibn Sa'ad says, I want you to bring all of the bodies so the women and children can cry on top of them. All of the bodies have someone crying on top of them. But there's no one crying on Owen and Muhammad. That say the Zainab is crying on the chest of her brother Abu Abdullah al-Hussein. That when say the Zainab, even after this, you see that the prisoners of Karbala, they were set free. When they were set free, you see that they were the heads were released. When the heads were released, every single head again had someone crying on top of it. Say the Zainab was crying and looking and crying over the head of Abu Abdullah Hussein. When they see the heads of Owen and Muhammad, when they see the own, when they see the heads of Owen and Muhammad, they say, oh, "Is there not someone to cry over these? Is their mother alive? Has their mother passed away?" That say the Zainab when she goes back to Medina, she goes to the shrine of her father or the shrine of her of her grandfather. She says, Ya Rasulullah, look what they've done to me. They've taken your Hussein. Look what they did him to him on the lands of Karbala. But she doesn't say Odin Muhammad. When she goes to her mother's grave, she says, My mother, if I could, I would take off my clothes and show you how many marks I have on my body from the strikes of shimmer from the strikes of these oppressors that say the Zainab when she walks into her house you see she walks in she and her her husband Abdullah looks at her and he says to her oh lady who are you she says has Karbala done such to me that even my own husband cannot recognize me but say the Zainab she had been patient the entire times but you see that what happens is is that when she sees the prayer mats of On and Muhammad she cannot bear it anymore.
انا لله وانا اليه راجعون وسيعلم الذين ظلموا ال محمد ان يوم قلب ينقلبون ما سمع حسين